in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Please pray with me. God, speak through your servant. Be with the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts. They might be found acceptable in thy sight. Through Jesus, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Words have power. The right words put together in just the right way have the ability to bring to life thoughts, concepts, and experiences. More than that, the right words actually create experiences. They create new realities and allow us to envision new possibilities. Words have the power to transport us to places where we see things we've never seen before and feel things that we've never felt before and become things that we could never imagine ourselves becoming before. Which one of us has not read a book and suddenly been transported to a place where we see things and we experience places we've never been? We have feelings we've never had and we we have insights into things we've never understood before. I think this may have been where the apostle, the apostle John was going when he was trying to talk about the eternal, transcendent, life-changing nature of Jesus Christ at the beginning of his gospel, when he said, in the beginning was the Word. God's word, God's truth, come to flesh and blood in Jesus Christ to help to transport us, to, to see things we haven't seen before, to understand things we didn't understand before, to become things that we couldn't have ever imagined becoming. Words are powerful. They're also complex and idiosyncratic. In every language, there are certain words and phrases and idioms that make no sense when you directly translate them. Some of them are silly. In English, we have hold your horses and sick as a dog and going cold turkey. I feel pumped. This is off the hook. When we try to say something is never going to happen, what do we say? When pigs fly. Where did that come from? It's actually an old Scottish proverb. The Russians have their own version of that, but in their version they say, when lobsters whistle on top of high mountains. <laughs> when we want to say that something is going to be easy, what do we say? We say it's a piece of cake. In Poland they say it's a roll with butter. <laughs> the Germans particularly, for some reason, have these words that hold on to so much more meaning. They're so difficult to unpack. Words that, that are so complex. Words like schadenfreude. That's the feeling that you get, the feeling of elation, joy that you get from hearing about someone else's misery. The Germans also have this word Torschlusspanik, which is the feeling of dread that you get when you realize that you haven't accomplished a lot in your life and time is quickly running out. Literally translated, it means gate closed panic. Like the gate is closing to your flight. The Germans also have this word, Kummerspeck, which is the, the weight that is gained through emotional binge eating. Literally translated, it means grief bacon. <laughs> and this saying, ich wischte nur bonnet, something like that. When you are speaking to someone in the German language and you, what you are saying is completely going over their head, they give you this phrase which means, I only understand train station. 
which sounds a little weird to us, but it really isn't any more weird than it's all Greek to me, which we totally understand, right? Unless, of course, you're from Athens, and that's a problem, or unless you've gone to seminary, unless you're like me, and then even if you've been to seminary, it still makes sense to say it's all Greek to me. With new times and new technology, there are new words and phrases. This Czech word, prosvenit, means to call someone's cell phone, but to only let it ring once and then hang up so that they will call you back. Make sense? In Argentina, they have the same concept. They call it hacer una prodid, which literally means to make a missed call. So interesting, isn't it? And yet I think my favorite, it comes from the Yagan language, which is the native language of Tierra del Fuego, and they have a single word that's something like mami la panatapai that refers to the glance that's shared between two people when they both want something to happen, the same thing to happen, but neither one of them wants to initiate it first. How is that? And yet of all of the dense complex words in the universe. I think maybe the most powerful and complex in the human language is the ancient Hebrew word shalom. We translate it into English as peace. But that is does no justice to the word shalom. Shalom is about so much more than just the absence of violence and, and chaos and conflict. It is a word that comes out of the doctrine, the theology of creation, and has to do with God's intended design for all of the world and all of creation. It has to do with God's intended plan for the relationships that we have with God, with ourselves, with each other, and with all of the elements of creation. Shalom goes so much deeper than just this typical understanding of peace. Shalom is about right relationships between all parts of creation. In that sense, it's about harmony and balance and about justice and safety and security and prosperity. It's about completion and wholeness and a fullness of life in all of its aspects. The word shalom, very much like the word aloha, is a word that we use. There you are. I was looking for you. Aloha is a word that we use as a greeting. Shalom can mean either hello or goodbye, but also like aloha, it's more than just a greeting. It's actually a sort of blessing, an invocation of the divine presence. Jesus. We see him say shalom throughout the Gospels. In fact, shalom al Chaim is the understanding of peace be unto you. It is. It's more than a, than a greeting. Jesus says this to the disciples when he first sees them in the upper room after the resurrection. He says the same thing to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Shalom Aleichem. Peace be unto you. This greeting, it's more than a greeting. It's a, it's a greeting. It's a blessing. It's a, it, it's a portrayal of God's character. It's an environmental manifesto. It's an eschatological wish. It's a call to action, all rolled up into one. There's a similar term in the African languages, this idea of Ubuntu. Ubuntu is another one of these complex words that goes so much deeper and means so much more than any Western language could properly translate. It talks about the very essence of being human. In Zulu, if you want to give someone the ultimate compliment, you say, Yo unombuntu, which means literally, you got a lot of Ubuntu. Someone who has Ubuntu is kind and generous and caring and loving and forgiving. They show a lot of hospitality. They aren't afraid to share what they have with others, but it's not necessarily just because they're such a good person or a goody two-shoes. It's because they understand the very essence of life. 
They understand that all of us, all human beings and all of creation are tied up together in one inseparable bundle of life. And that when something happens that's good for one of us, it's good for all of us. That when one person is hurt or suffering, that in a very real sense we are all hurt and suffering. That when one person's humanity is robbed from them or they're diminished, in a very real sense we are all diminished. And when one person is empowered or freed, in a very real sense we are all freed. Archbishop Desmond Tutu used to say all the time that he believed that apartheid was crushing the, his white South African brothers and sisters even more than the black South African brothers and sisters because at least the black South Africans understood that their humanity was being robbed from them. This understanding of shalom it is about an inner peace and tranquility, an inner balance and harmony, but it's so much more than that. Because true shalom, in, in true shalom, we can never feel a total peace until all aspects of creation are at peace, until all people are, are prosperous and healthy and balanced and whole. This doesn't go over very well in Western society with our incredible focus on the individualism. Because with real shalom, when some are in power and others have no power, it's just impossible to achieve shalom. It's, it's impossible to have that kind of peace, inner or outer, when some of us have places to live and others don't. Some of us have food to eat and others don't. Some of us have clothes to wear and others don't. Rob Bell, a few years ago, when he went to Africa for the first time, he ended up one, at one point in one of the most violent cities in all of Africa, and he asked his guide to show him the things that he thought that Rob most needed to see. And so one night, early in his visit, the guide asked the driver to drive them into the most dangerous part of town, and his driver said, oh, that's not a good idea. But the guide insisted, and so they drove out from the inner city out into one of the huge slums, and as, it, as they got further into the slum, it got darker and darker, and more and more they saw more fires on the side of the road, and it was becoming obviously more and more dangerous. As they got into the most dangerous part of the slum, the, the guide said to the driver, okay, let us out here, and the driver's like, oh, that is not a good idea, and Rob Bell's starting to think, this may not be a good idea. But the guide insisted, and so they got out, and he told the driver to meet them a quarter mile down the road. And so the two of them were walking down this road in the dark, and as they did, out of the shadows came all of these 14, 15, 16-year-old girls whispering to them, treasure, 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 treasure. Rob asked, what this might possibly mean, and his guide said, Tresham is a term that we use for a unit of money. It's about the equivalent of 25 cents U.S. These girls are offering themselves to you for the night for a quarter. But what you need to understand is that most of them, their parents, have already died from this AIDS epidemic that we're going through, and for many of these girls, they are going to be the oldest ones in their family, and they've probably worked all day but haven't been able to make enough money to feed their younger brothers and sisters, and they're the only ones who are left to care for their families. And so they've come out here tonight to offer themselves to you for 25 cents for the night so that they could scratch together a couple more coins in order to feed their siblings. first time I heard that, all I could think about is if I had been born into a different place under slightly different circumstances, that could be Ryan trying to figure out a way to feed clay. And so the question is, obviously, is how can we 
have any sort of inner peace or tranquility when things like that are going on in the world. When families are living down in Tijuana in cardboard boxes and children are living and literally dying on the streets of Los Angeles in this freezing cold weather that we're having and children are being separated from their parents at the border of our nation and children are falling off of rubber rafts in the Mediterranean trying to escape from Syria and 26,500 children are dying every single day from causes related to their poverty. How can we find any sort of inner peace and tranquility? And the easy answer is we can't. And we're not supposed to. Because a big part of shalom is this inner heartbreak and longing and aching for things to be different. This longing that all of us should have for God's kingdom to come and for things to be different and for God's intended design to be more and more what happens to be, to want to be part of helping God to build God's version of what the world should look like and relationships should look like here on earth. Shalom is deeper than just trying to find a little bit of inner peace. It is so much more than that. And that's tough when you're living in a world like we live in today, in the wealthiest nation in all of human history. It becomes so easy to put on our blinders and to not look up and to just mind our own business and try to ignore what's going on around us and the suffering and pain around the world so that we can eke out a little bit of our own peace, but it ends up being, and we even sometimes we come to church thinking that we're going to pray and sing and put ashes on our forehead and maybe give up meat for Lent or do a little bit of fasting and that that is going to bring the inner peace that we're looking for, but it doesn't and it can't. And we know deep down inside why. And I'm not saying this to rail against our, our society or this time and place because this has been going on forever. 26,000 years ago, or 2,600 years ago, the prophet Isaiah was talking about the exact same thing in, in, the, in the book of Isaiah. The Israelites were at a pretty prosperous and good time in their life. Things were good. They were eating well. They, th things were, were, were good for them. They were living the high life, and many of the nations and peoples around them weren't, but they were trying to be faithful, and they were coming to synagogue, and they were going through the fasts, and they were bringing their offerings. And Isaiah is very blunt about it. He says, this is not how you are going to find that inner peace. This is not where shalom resides. This is not how you're going to find that completion, that harmony, that balance you're looking for. And then he lays it out really straight. Isaiah in chapter 58 says, Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen for you? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn. And your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guide. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression and with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always, he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. 
You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. This week, we enter into this 40-day window of opportunity to feed our souls with the things that we are most thirsty and ache for, a genuine connection with God, an understanding of God's shalom inside and outside. Many churches give things up for Lent. Some people give up meat, other people give up coffee or chocolate. Here at BPC, we're bigger fans of a Isaiah kind of Lent, where we do something, we add something to our lives that are going to help us to enter into a deeper kind of shalom. Maybe for you, that's going to be finding out about issues that you know are going on around the world, doing a little bit of study and research on some of the justice issues that are, we're facing around this globe. Maybe for you, it's going to be going out and getting involved in more ways of serving others and trying to make a difference, signing up for as many marathon of service projects as you can. They say that It takes only 30 days to start a habit that could last a lifetime. Many people have taken Lent as an opportunity to begin doing something, adding something to to their life that could make all of the difference for the rest of your life. What would it look like if for the next 40 days you were to give your spouse or your significant other or your children a big hug and a kiss? And that lasted for the rest of your life. What would it look like if you took some time, five or ten minutes to pray and meditate every day, or, or just shot off a quick email of encouragement to someone else in your life every day for these next 40 days. Or if you really wanted to know what shalom is all about, what the connection between inner peace and outer peace actually looks like, what God's vision of the ideal world would be, what God's kingdom is supposed to look like, what that balance and peace and harmony with ourselves and God and with others and all of creation was intended to look like, then maybe you should be sinking yourself into this word. Maybe you make a commitment over the next 40 days to read just one chapter in the Bible each day. It would probably take you three to five minutes. If it's something that you'd be willing to do, I'd suggest maybe you start in one of the Gospels. Maybe you would even start with John, where the very first words you'll read are, In the beginning was the Word. Or Matthew, or Mark, or Luke, or maybe you would read from Psalms, or from Romans, or Philippians. What would it look like if you started a habit this Lenten season that just might last the rest of your life and make more of a difference in your life than anything else? Because words are powerful. They have the power to shape reality and to allow us to envision new possibilities. This word has the power to make dreams come true, to help us to see things and feel things and experience things we haven't felt or experienced before. It has the power to help us become things We've never even imagined becoming before. If you want to know what real shalom means, what it means to allow ourselves to take off the blinders and open our eyes and see the world as it is, to allow ourselves to feel and long and ache for God's kingdom, to allow ourselves to allow our hearts to break with the things that break the heart of God, Immerse yourself in this word, and you will understand what real peace looks like inside your own life, between you and and the people in your life,
and in a world that is desperate for us to begin envisioning and then living out a new reality. Shalom. Shalom alechem. May God's peace and fullness and wholeness and harmony and balance and prosperity and justice be in you and with you, now and forever.